Hello. Hello, please. Yeah, what's the problem, sir? Um, we've just closed down our farm track. Yeah. So, and, uh, feed our pheasants. We've come across a Range Rover with three people in it. Yeah. It appears that they're dead. I don't know what's happening. Blood in the motor all over them. back to a new video on the Essex Boys case. As always, if you are enjoying the content, please do give the video a thumbs up. And if you're interested in the Essex Boys case, or simply true crime in general, don't forget to hit the subscribe button below. Now before I start this video, it's important for me to mention that the author does not seek to discredit any previous accounts or versions of events leading up to the gruesome murders. He merely offers an interesting alternative scenario to be considered. Bill entered Scotland Yard at 8.30, a full 30 minutes before his expected time of arrival. He passed his policeman's warrant card over and was given in exchange the visitor's pass. He would swap the pass back for the cop's badge on departure. When would that be? He wasn't sure. Perhaps he would be there for a few hours, maybe most of the day if it was some sort of training course. At 9am sharp, a uniformed WPC came and collected DS Handley. Other than basic pleasantries, nothing was said to him, as he was led deep into the mother of law enforcement's nest. New Scotland Yard, Broadway, London, SW1. The iconic home of the Metropolitan Police. The home of the great and the good who ran the Metropolitan Police Force. Sergeant Bill Handley's Masters. After a number of corridors and an elevator ride, then more corridors, a couple of card swipes to pass through doors, and Bill was led into the inner sanctum. The sanctum of what? He had no idea. It was his first and only ever visit to the high temple of policing in England. The swagger of two guys who exited the doors he had just entered while he was directed to a small seating area was totally different to the crisp enthusiastic movements of the uniformed officers who he had passed on the lower floors in the entrance lobby. These two guys looked more like Romford motor traders at best and had an air of what at worst could be called mischief or worse still, arrogance. Surely this wasn't the custody suite. Maybe it was just two wide boys making bail. Were they about to stroll through the building unaccompanied? Bill, still watching the door they'd exited through closely, when he heard his name called. Hey Bill, how are you son? It was a warm and casual greeting from a guy who had just appeared from whence the horse thieves had just come. The casually dressed man in a soft tweed jacket threw Bill for a moment, but Bill was good with faces and names. It was Detective Chief Inspector Brett. A few years had passed and Bill had only met the man once. Hello sir, how are you? Bill stood and walked forward with his hand extended. It was warmly clasped with two hands. I'm good Bill. Pretty much retired, but I still come in on a few things. Hope life's treating you well. How is that pretty lady in Upminster looking after you? Bill knew how the British intelligence services worked. He had done enough for them in another life. It bit him hard to the bone when he realised he had been on the receiving end of it. He let it go over his head, but he saw no good reason for the man in front of him to know bugger all about his private life. And if he did, it wasn't a subject for him to bring up, unless he wanted Bill to know he knew. She looks after me just fine, sir. Bill tried to hide the abrasion in his reply. He wasn't sure if he had. The smile remained unmoved on Brett's face. I bet you're wondering what this is all about. Just follow me. I thought it might be a good idea if we had a little chat. A colleague of mine is going to join us, if that's all right. It was one of those army-type questions. English grammar rules would dictate the sentence construction made it a question. Enough years in the army enabled Bill to assimilate clever use of the Queen's English and well veiled orders. Bill had been, and always would be, the Queen's man. Bill followed DCI Brett along the corridor into a large office. There was a guy a few years older than Brett finishing up a phone call behind the office's large desk. In front of the desk, a long low coffee table, with a pair of two-seater leather sofas either side of it, and all perpendicular to the desk. The furniture unlike anything in the Romford Nick and probably the rest of this building. For all Bill knew, 
It looked like something from an English country house, all dark green leather and dark hardwood. Brett closed the door behind him. A gentleman was seated on the sofa facing Bill. He was even older. Grey hair thinning, a bright ruddy complexion and just a few pounds overweight. What was missing was a handlebar moustache, thought Bill. It might have made the man look altogether different, friendly even. Because clean-shaven, he had a malevolence about him. It was in the dead shark black eyes. He allowed a smile to cross his face as he scrutinised Bill, but it did nothing to soften the hardness of the man. Brett indicated for Bill to sit, which Bill did, opposite the smiler who had not got up. But he did offer his hand across the coffee table. Bill took it as he sat. It was dry, hard and cold. Bill had the feeling he was shaking hands with a corpse. DCI Brett did the introductions as the phone was dropped into the cradle by the man at the desk. This is my old boss, Superintendent Spendlove. The guy got up from behind his desk. He was bored as a baby's ass, but it suited him. Spendlove moved considerably well for his age. Bill could tell he was a guy who was fit and looked after himself, unlike the guy sat in front of him. Spendlove took Bill's hand in much the same way as DCI Brett had done. For a moment, Bill wondered if it was some sort of Masonic handshake. He'd heard about masonry when he had joined the police force. It had no appeal to him and he'd made no effort to find out about it. Bill thought he'd been approached once in a roundabout way when he first arrived at Romford Nick, but he'd spurned the conversation quickly. He was already a member of one elite organisation and had dropped out of that. No point joining another. The golf club might get him one day, but nothing more secretive interested him. And this is Mr P. Seaton. Had Bill heard him correctly? He was no way a P. C. Seaton. No. He had introduced the man as Mr P., with no mention of rank and no idea what the P was for. Mr P. Seaton was the alpha male and the mystery man in the room. Spendlove went around the coffee table and sat next to him. The leather sofas were large. No one was crowded when DCI Brett sat next to Bill on his side of the coffee table. Silence stretched for a long moment. No one was going to start. Even Bill knew the room belonged to Mr P, but he seemed in no rush to break the extended silence. Sergeant, how are you finding things over there in Romford? Mr P sat back into the leather sofa as he finished a very general question he'd thrown out there. OK, yeah, perhaps it would be nice if we got a few more results, but the team are a good bunch and everyone is positive. I think in general the reputation of the force is good in the town. Bill thought it a lame answer as he finished. But the question was very general, and although he had a good few grievances, it was probably best to sound positive. He was giving his best attempt at an answer he thought could be reasonably well received and not lead to another open-ended question. He had done enough interviewing himself, and tried to keep his brain ahead of his mouth. Mr P sat forward. The mouth smiled. The eyes never did. A far cry from your last job. I bet there are times you find it all a bit frustrating. Bill didn't want to be led into a line of conversation which would then get backed up on him, make him look like a whinger, not a team player. He still had no idea why he was there. I think anyone on the team would have their moments of frustration. In my previous career, the lines were usually more clearly drawn. For a start, the other side wore a uniform and played openly for the other side, so to speak. Here, it gets a little cloudy sometimes and the rules of engagement are different. Bill smiled as he finished. Mr P had brought up his military career, not him. So he thought by making light of it, he would be able to draw a line through the subject. Not to me, they're not, Bill. You don't mind if I call you Bill, do you? The question seemed genuine enough. The face was smiling, but never the eyes. Of course not, sir. Anyone authority was sir to an older soldier, and Mr P definitely had an air of authority. The calm and relentless authority oozed from the man called P. Everyone in the room hung on his every word. Now there are some pretty nasty characters out there who have been pushing the boundaries. They seem to think that they can operate in Britain with impunity. Well, I'm not going to tolerate that. And we are doing something about it. We have been steadily growing the numbers here at the branch. And I expect to make things particularly uncomfortable for quite a few people. The conversation was clearly between Bill and Mr P. The other two men 
were just there to make up the numbers. I'm not sure I'll follow, sir. That's okay, Bill, I didn't expect you to. It's just me rambling again. Mr P was a conundrum of personalities to Bill. However, he was not some bumbling fool, whom he had just tried to play when he dismissed himself as a rambler. Mr P sat back again. Bill caught him give Spendlove a subtle nod. Bill, I assume it's fair to say that you're not really sure why you're here today. It was more than a reasonable assumption. No one had told Bill anything. It was beginning to feel like army stuff and he had long forgotten the drill. It was starting to make the hairs on the back of his neck tingle, just like they used to when the squadron was called into the briefing room back at Hereford or some other godforsaken part of the world, when the men huddled together to be explained the miracle they were about to perform, the one they had all volunteered for, the one they had all trained for, the one they all had no idea existed in truth until that moment. Bill shrugged his shoulders, smiled and replied, I haven't got a bloody clue if you'll excuse my French. Special branch, Bill. Special branch, old chap. Would you fit in here? It was Mr P, who had cut across Spendlove, who was just about to say something. I'm not sure. I guess so. You guess so? Well, so do I, son. Mr P sat back and intoned for Spendlove to continue. As Mr P puts it, we think you'd be a very useful asset here, and we are doing something over your way which I understand you have some experience of, and you should know some of the principles we are interested in. It'd be a permanent move to Special Branch, and it's generally considered an upward one. Bill relaxed a little. He was being offered something. This wasn't the regiment, and the downside had to be minimal. He could probably even say no. A real luxury when he thought about it. I would be very interested. Where would I be based, here? Officially, yes, but you could be working from somewhere nearer to home for a while. Again, Mr P cut in with an answer. Rank and pay? Why not enjoy the luxuries the army had never offered? He chuckled inwardly to himself as he posed a bold question. Same and same. But the overtime you get to put in will make Romford's wage packet decidedly paltry in comparison. You see, we operate a little differently here at the branch you'll find, Bill. We are an exclusive club, and the members will tell you that. Isn't that so, Peter? DCI Brett had a first name and he wasn't really being asked a question by Spendlove. Peter took his cue. It is. I'm retired. I called it a day last year. But once you've been in, you're never really out. I guess it's a bit like that with a special air service, isn't it, Bill? Would you be surprised if I told you no? I mean, it can be, if you want it to be, and you want to keep the umbilical cord in place. You know, go to all the reunions and hang around the base. But to be honest, most guys just drift away and move on, get on with their lives. I mean, it's not like what you learn is much use on Civvy Street. I know some guys go off and try, you know, security or even mercenary stuff. I suppose that's the image a lot of people attach to us. But if you want to know the truth, then I'll tell you the sensible guys keep quiet about the job. Go and get on with their lives as best they can and never look back. That surprises me, Bill. Peter and Spendlove almost answered in stereo. Mr P gave Bill a knowing look. OK, Bill. Well, I guess we are a little different to the army in more ways than I knew. The reason I'm here today, I was asked to come in early and run through your file with my former colleagues here, as I've worked with you once before, and I'm doing a little consulting for the branch on the project they are considering you for. I can tell you, I think you would make an excellent candidate. Peter Brett, now the civilian in the room, sat back and gestured for Spendlove to continue. Now, we know that you're not from Essex, we know that you're not from the local area, we know that you've got no family or associations there, apart from your young lady up in Upminster. But you've put in a solid effort, both at Romford and previously at Ilford, so you know the patch very well. The downside, obviously, is that you are known to most of the coppers at Romford, but we can't have everything. The pros outweigh the cons. The principal area of interest barely touches on Romford, to be frank. It's mainly the Essex Police's patch you'll be working, although there will be some crossover with the Met's turf. Bill was listening carefully but Spendlove was beginning to sound like he was talking in riddles. Mr P sat forward. This isn't going to make a lot of sense to you at the moment, Bill. Are you in or out? I think I'm in. Bill was slightly hesitant as he answered. I'll take that as a yes, Bill. Mr P leant forward and shook Bill's hand over the table. Right, Bill. Special Branch is tasked with all sorts of things, but our primary reason for existence when formed in 1883 
was the Fenian threat. They were the murderous thugs who were here to reap havoc on the streets of London. Bombing, murder, terrorism and extortion were the stocking trade for the Irish Republican Army operating in London. Since then, the branch has been responsible for all matters concerning any threat to our democratic way of life in the United Kingdom. Terrorism, and now in particular organised crime and drugs, are on our radar. There are certain exclusive resources we have here, and we are working on a number of cases. It is not always our intention to act directly or intervene at the first sign of infringement of the law. We are here to build a bigger picture and achieve wider objectives. It is currently all about intelligence gathering and strategy. We look at the big picture. Sometimes we might feed information to the local forces, let them deal with an incident in its individual right. You know, gently steer them in the direction which gets them results, while we sit in the background and look at the whole. Spend love, look to Mr P for approval of what he had just said as he sat back. Bill, I'm sure you've had your fair share of frustration working at CID. You probably feel like you're missing the bigger players. You know they're out there and bad stuff's going on, but you just can't put your hand on their collars. The bigger players are almost making a mockery of you. You've got football hooligans now driving around in Porsches and Mercedes cars with no legitimate business income to explain the villa in Marbella and the big house in the leafy Essex suburbs. They've learnt quickly how to defeat you. They lawyer up and hide behind the no-comment interviews. No one would give evidence against them. They stroll out of the police station's front door laughing at you. Well, we are targeting them now. And one by one, they'll get unravelled. It may not happen overnight, but their days are numbered. This is our country, Bill. We make the rules, not them. And if they think they're above the law because they have a bit of muscle, well, they're going to fall very hard when we put them down. Bill nodded in the appropriate places while Mr P spoke. He didn't sound as if he was rambling. He sounded like a man with purpose and direction. OK, so if I'm on board, what happens now? My office will deal with the administrative matters. Head back to Romford today and deal with what you need to for the rest of the week. They will get a replacement sergeant in the next day or so. I think we have most things ready to go. There's not too many people turn us down. You'll have to report here once a week, same time, and I will introduce you to the guys you'll be working with. Everyone stood, following Mr P's lead. The meeting was clearly over for Bill. I'll walk Bill out, gentlemen, Mr P said as he shook Spendlove's hand. Bill did a round of handshakes and headed out behind Mr P. Bill, I think you'll fit in just fine here at the branch. Lots of opportunities and interest in work. I know you've already signed the Official Secrets Act and understand its implications, so please do remember the commitment you made. There will be things pertaining to what we do here that are not for mainstream policing. I don't know what you want to say to your mates at Romford, but anything said here today is not for their ears. The easiest thing is to just say anti-terrorism, which sounds mysterious enough and covers a multitude of sins for us. No one expects you to divulge what you're working on once you drop that one on them. Bill collected his warrant card at reception. Mr P shook his hand and turned back into the building. You have been listening to the book Once Upon a Time in Essex. This book is available to purchase online at Amazon and other online book retailers. Many thanks for joining me for this video. Very shortly you'll be able to see some other videos from the channel, including the Essex Boys playlist, which has all of the videos concerning this case in one convenient folder. If you like this video, please do give it a thumbs up. If you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing. I look forward to seeing you all again in the next video. Take care. Cheers.